Thank you. This month, we have looked at theosophy and the theosophical movement. In previous weeks, we've looked at the origin of theosophy, theosophy in Eastern thought, theosophy in Western thought, what we call the ancient wisdom. This morning's topic and lecture is on ancient theosophy and modern thought. So we thought would it be begin to good idea to begin with a definition of what we mean by modern thought and the modern age. And so we're going to rely on the consensus of scholarly opinion by our uh, historians, and we're also going to look at the modern thought or modern age in the Western world, particularly in Europe and America, realizing that there are trends of modern thought in other areas of the world as well. So historians define the modern age as beginning in the 17th and extending through the 18th and 19th centuries. They speak of an early, middle, and late modern age, so to speak. And each of these ages is a combined with a revolution, not only in the plane of thought, but also on the physical plane in the affairs of human beings. And so the modern age in its earliest phase goes from about 1500 to 1650. And here we see the basic change, the revolution being that the dominance of religious belief is replaced by scientific method and facts. And more and more, that becomes the standard of thought in the modern age and the basis of its advancement. And then we want to speak of a middle aspect of the modern age. Uh, we would talk about the importance of individual and individual rights and responsibilities in especially regard to government. So during this age, we see the revolutions that occur in America and France and the transferring of power from monarchies to the will of the people. Uh, and more and more the idea of democracy becoming prevalent. And the late modern age uh, would be going from about 1790 to 1920. And here we begin the growth of a social conscience, a start, beginning of the steps toward the ideals of brotherhood, the importance of achieving social and economic equality. And so in each of these aspects of the modern age, we're going to focus on a particular individual uh, and their way of bringing forth the ancient teachings of theosophy to accommodate the prevailing thought and trend of the age. So in the 17th century, we're going to talk about Jakob Burma, who lived from 1575 the 1624, in that middle aspect of the modern age where the revolutions took place, we're talking about the contributions of Louis Claude Saint Martin, who lived from 1743 to 1843, 1803 rather. And in the 19th century, where we see the elevation of individual responsibility for social and economic equality, we're going to look at Ralph Waldo Emerson from 1803 to 1882. And in each of these individuals, we're going to do a little bit of biographical sketch of their lives and focus on their fundamental principles, almost as if they were doing the fundamental principles on our platform <laughs> here in ULT, but, and also focus on their method of spiritual regeneration. In other words, how they took their fundamental teachings and taught people to make them practical in their everyday lives. So we'll begin with Jakob Burma, who we said uh, lived from 1575 to 1640, 1624. Now he was born in Germany, uh, in Alt Seidenberg in 1575. He died in Dresden, uh, November 17th, interestingly enough, 1624. 
Uh, William Q. Judge definitely speaks of him as an agent of the Lodge of Adepts, one of four agents, which we'll mention later. And HPB refers to him as a nursling of the Nirmanakayas who watched over and guided him. She also co quotes him a great seer who presented ideas that were way in advance of modern science. This individual was born the son of a poor German, of poor German peasants, and he was devoid of any formal education in the ordinary sense. And he eventually became a shoemaker by trade. Yet his writings would have influenced many of the great intellects of the modern age, including such giants as Isaac Newton and also Saint Martin, as we will see. Now his inner vision, his ability as a seer, opened up to him at a very early age. He had three great illuminations in his life, each showing a progressive realization of the ancient wisdom and each followed by a period of publication and lecturing. His first illumination occurred when he was 19 years old and resulted in awareness that duty well performed is the highest form of spiritual consciousness, which he called Christ consciousness. Remember, he's teaching in a time when there's a gradual transition in the West from the doctrines of the church and to science. And so he's speaking to an audience or is writing to an audience that is well indoctrinated in the a certain idea about what Jesus or the Christ represents. So he's using language appropriate to the times. His second illumination occurred uh, in 25, when he was 25 years old in 1600. And he writes of that, while in that state, my spirit immediately saw through everything and recognized God in everything, even in the herbs and grasses. His third illumination occurred when he was 35 years old. In this vision, he said, all his former experiences were synthesized and he recognized them as different expressions of one underlying truth, the source of all religions, sciences, and philosophies. Notice his tendency now to bring in science as well as religion. William Q. Judge writes of Jakob Burma, born a Christian, he nevertheless saw the esoteric truth lying under the moss and crust of centuries and from the Christian Bible extracted for his purblind fellows those pearls which they refused to accept. Before his internal eye, the panorama of real knowledge passed. So we're going to focus in the fundamental teachings of him, uh, primarily what we would call the first fundamental. Uh, two of his most important books, or, books were that of Aurora, and the signature of all things, which uh, are available in their original uh, translation if you're interested. So his philosophy deals with the nature of deity, which he called the Christ principle. Now he came up with a very interesting Germanic uh, substitute for that, which for those of you who are familiar with German can understand the complexity of it, he called this uh, absolute principle the unground or ungroundedness, an eternal universal principle which exists and also exists not, an ungroundedness to be regarded as an eternal nothing. The absolute unground is the unknowable source of nature. Now, you know, we speak of symbols a ways of understanding this. We talk of space. But he gives us an, an extraordinary metaphor, which when you think about it, really opens up this realization for us in, in a way that we think no other image had done before or has done since. And he compares this to a mirror. Listen to his words. The image 
and the mirror. One is free from the other. Yet the mirror is the container of the image. The young ground stands out of all relation to noumenal nature and yet contains it. So think of a mirror and all the images you can see in the mirror. The images are something, the mirror is something different. The mirror is unchanging. It never changes. The images come and go and change within it. The images exist because the mirror is there, yet the mirror is not the images. It contains the images, but it does not participate in them. Can you get that? When you look into a mirror, there has to be a mirror there that all the images can reflect on, but they're not the images. They're the source, the basis, but are not involved. Now expand that mirror to being everywhere without beginning, without end. And you get the idea of the universe coming forth as an image within it, contained within it, and yet that deity uh, is separate from it and not involved, it's impersonal. Isn't that a wonderful point for meditation on the relation of the, or the lack of relationship of the absolute to the conditional? He postulated a universal divine essence or supreme principle from and within which the universe evolves according to seven principles, giving, mom, giving man and nature seven principles. Now, he called these tincture, he called these principles tinctures, powers, sources, or fountains. We speak of principles as a basis of thought and action. And look at the words he uses. A principle is where a form of life and motion come forth such as not existed before. So he talks about a principle as a manifestation of a, of a form of life and motion, which is the same as saying a basis of thought and action. There are invisible threads, he writes, connecting the seven principles in man with their corresponding principles in the, in the cosmos. Quote, each principle is attracted by, knows, and loves that which is like unto itself. So he spoke of principles that come forth in all the departments of nature, and it's our basis of interconnection with the universe. We see here the basic idea of universal brotherhood being a fact in nature. San Martin wrote of Jakob Burma. Jakob Burma took for granted the existence of a universal principle. He was persuaded that everything is connected in the immense chain of truths and that the eternal nature reposed on seven principles or bases and that those seven bases exist also in this disordered material nature under constraint. And then in his signature of all things, he wrote, the whole outward world that is visible to us with all its being is a signature or figure of the inward spiritual world, whatever is internally and however it, its operation is, so likewise has its character externally. So there is a correspondence and analogy between what is going on in the inner spiritual uh, um, world and what appears manifested in the physical, as above, so below. Quote, in nature, the visible world comes to express the divine corporality by which all things are generated and come to form a being. They have their seat and synthesize, synthesis in the seventh, which overbroods but never directly informs. So we see the language here. It's, it's beginning to take a modern shape, but certainly is not near what we would call our modern expression. And yet we see that movement towards the defining of what it means, that God idea. So regarding the regeneration of man and the method by which it may be achieved, this occupied a 
prominent place in his right, writings. He taught that man is imprisoned by his lower nature and can only release himself through his own free will. How to do this? He wrote, man has inclinations towards both good and evil. When he is drawn towards the world of manifestation, evil predominates. But when he responds to the vitalizing sap within the tree of life, good elevates towards deity, which is the sap itself. How can man rise above the temptation of the senses, selfishness, and pride to awaken the spiritual will and spiritual perceptions? He writes, when thou canst throw thyself into that where no creature dwelleth, though it be for a moment, then thou hearest what God speaketh. Blessed art thou, therefore, if thou canst stand still from self-thinking and self-willing, and canst stop and can stop the wheel of thy imagination and senses. Then thou art come into the superimaginariness and into the intellectual life, which is a state of living love above images, figures, and shadows. Nothing can harm one for one who becomes like all things. But if thou wilt be like all things, thou must forsake all things. To desire one thing or another is to establish a bond with it, and this bond separates one from the rest of nature while allowing that one thing to affect and modify one's own nature. The only desire that leads to the supersensual life is the desire of Christ, the heart of deity, for in that one surrenders, for in that one surrenders one's will to the original will of being. Very well. Just notice the tone of the thought and how it fits in with the age. Now we're going to move forward to Louis Claude de Saint Martin, who's now working through this middle modern age where there's revolutions going on and the movement of control from government to the individual. And watch how his expression changes. So he was born into a noble family uh, at Ambos, Ambois, France, January 18th, 1743. He died October uh, 1803. He was a learned and profound philosopher who was, who was just as simple and modest. Now, he was known as the unknown philosopher, not because nobody knew who he was, but he practiced impersonality. In other words, he signed his own writings as the unknown philosopher. And people knew he wrote many of these things, but he did not put himself as a person, the origin of his writing. He put them out there for people to consider. And he even told his, his students, keep the identity of the origin of the idea is secret. It's really more the ideas that are important. And so when you think of the other agents involved, most of us, he is one of the most powerful and influential people of the time who was more successful in what he did than many others, but you don't know that much about him. That's by design. That was the impersonality of his, of his method. Once again, getting away from external authority to the authority of the individual. One of, he was one of the four agents of the lodge who worked together during the 18th century. His particular work was to bring the Masonic orders in Europe and England back to their original character as vehicles for the promulgation of Eastern occultism and to challenge the prevailing materialism and antisocial tendencies of his age. He found that the Masonic orders in Europe were primarily interested in magical incantations. He warned against the dangers of spiritualism and wrote that occult powers without an underlying moral background are dangerous weapons. He helped founded the Masonic order of Martinists, which taught a high code of ethics and theosophical principles. 
The four agents of the Lodge, Saint Martin, Saint Germain, Cagliostro, and Mesmer, uh, met at the great Masonic conventions of 1782 and 1785. Saint Martin did not occupy himself with politics or with the political interests and turmoil which agitated Europe at the time. In keeping with the individualism of the age, his object was to recall all men and women to the principle of unity and the law by which all would find them and the law of which all would find within themselves without the need of depending on books or external authority. Nevertheless, the sacred motto of his order, the Martinists, liberty, equality, fraternity, was adopted to become the rallying cry of the French Revolution. And what would he say if he were on our platform giving our three fundamentals? And you'll see he was very much influenced by Jakob Burma. And he credits himself as being a disciple uh, of Jakob Burma. Quote, there must be a living essence behind the manifested universe, a life substance, which is the groundwork of existence, one actuality which man perceives as himself. Notice the connection here between deity and the essential self that we know that we can perceive as being one and the same. As to the second fundamental, the manifested universe rests upon two fundamental bases, which express themselves as light and darkness, cause and effect, and we can follow this principle through the whole chain of being. There must, now here's where it gets into the practical under aspect of karma, and we think you'll recognize these ideas as we repeat them even today, look how modern they are. There must be a perfect analogy between the punishment and the fault, for the punishment and the crime must be founded one upon the other. He warned that one should not regard sufferings as misfortunes, but as blessings. He wrote, if we confess that nothing can happen to us, but what are our dues, we will find that instead of complaining, we ought to be thankful. Man's first duty is to cease complaining, find no fault, in other words. His second duty is to go straight ahead without turning to the left or right as, quote, this alone will bring us back to that life from which the offense or lapse separated us. Quote, man, look here again to the individual role, the the place of the individual in the universe. Man is the only true witness and positive sign by which the supreme universal source may be known. For there is nothing else in the world can, that can do it directly. Man is the only being that can perceive deity directly. Quote, the spirit man has at once the dignity of his being and his superiority over the external order the spirit man has at once the effect, aid, and free action of those laws. Man is the result of karma, in other words. Karma comes to his benefit, but he is also has the free will to act in a proposition to karma or to the law. He will, of course, receive the results of that, but he has free will. And listen to this about our relationship to the universe. The universe would not have passed its days if you had yourself remained in the glory in which you were originally seated. Man has to get involved with the universe. Inject quickly the elixir of life into all its channels, for it is for you to bring it to life again. And we found his uh, practical application some of the most wonderful and inspiring of any we've heard. We'd like to share them with you. He spoke of the threefold tasks we have to make these ideas practical. First and foremost, to regenerate yourself. Second, 
to regenerate nature, and third, to become a steward of the earth. This requires the cultivation of the spiritual will. Listen to what he says. Beware of departing even for a moment from the radiant central fire on which you rest. Remain constantly in this central spiritual fire as an infant remains in its mother's womb. Man cannot produce a thought, a word, an act, which is not imprinted on the eternal nature, on which everything is engraved and from which nothing is ever effaced. Lose not for a moment in recurring within you all these measures if you have allowed them to die. Now he told us to focus on our, the laws of speech because it is through our speech and the use of word that we can most powerfully regenerate ourselves. We can unite ourselves by our word with the ineffable source of truth, but we can also, by its criminal use, unite ourselves with the awful bliss of lies and darkness. Listen to these gems. We should regard human intelligence so highly that nothing unworthy should be presented to it. In other words, we should not allow ourselves to be, to, to be exposed to any words from without that are not worthy of our high intelligence, nor should we speak words to others that are not worthy of their high intelligence. Two, we should approach our listeners by offering them an intellectual gift through words. Our words can be a gift of knowledge to others. We should strive to add to the light of virtue of those whom we converse. Every conversation is an opportunity to add to the virtue of others through our words. We should make our conversation center around, we should, excuse me, we should make our conversation center around spiritual truths. We should distribute our words with moderation and discrimination. Word is the light of infinity, which should be constantly increased. Control of speech is the prime requisite of the spiritual life. It transforms passion into compassion, lust into love, antipathy into sympathy. As for the rest of it, not, we should not have a desire but is not obedient to the law. We should not have an idea which is not a sacred communication from our higher nature. And we should not utter a word which is not a sovereign decree of our higher nature. We should not have an act which is not a development, an extension, of the vivifying power of the word. He wrote prophetically because he wrote in an age when there was a relative failure. There were some minor successes, but predominantly the age was too materialistic for the promulgation and the extension of the ancient wisdom. The time is not far off when the people of Europe would eagerly search for things they had formerly treated with contempt. The literary wealth of Asia will come to their aid. When they see the treasures which India literature begins to open, when they have studied the Mahabharata and the Vedas, they will be struck with the similarity of thought of East and West. And he died in 1803, the very year that the individual who would usher in the language that prepared the way among the minds in the West, particularly in America, for the reception of the ancient wisdom that HPV put forward, allowed the West to develop its own vocabulary that could match uh, the doctrines of the East. And that individual was Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 1882. He was born in Boston, May 25th, 1803, died in Concord, 1882. 
April 27th, 1882. Inc incidentally, his seventh grandfather removed was the founder of Concord. He came from a long line of scholars and preachers and was himself a, the minister of the Second Church of Boston at the age of 23. Six years later, he left the church, which to him had exaggerated the personal and the ritual, rather than communicating the doctrine of the soul. He went on to become one of the founders and sustainers of the Transcendentalists, a movement which originating in Concord spread to become prominent in America by the mid 19th century. It had many points of, in common with the emergence of the modern theosophical movement in 1875. According to Emerson, quote, a transcendentalist is one who takes his departure from his own consciousness and, and reactions, uh, who takes his departure from his consciousness and reckons the world as an appearance. In other words, a transcendentalist who is one who follows his own consciousness as being the real source of knowledge and wisdom and regards the external world as an appearance only. So what were the ideas that were embodied with this word transcendentalism? One, that there is a universal spirit which unites all human beings, which transcends the differences of nature. And the divine revelation comes to us from individual reflection, not from external authority, but from individual reflection. And that we can best uh, develop this um, transcendentalism by being self-reliant. This was one of the key importances, self-reliant instead of relying on external authority. Nature is the manifestation of the universal spirit, that nature is the reflection, and we should respect it that way, but universal spirit is the source. And so there should be a communion, a unity with nature. According to Emerson, the views of the transcend, this is what he says, the views of the transcendentalists were not new, but were the very oldest views presented in a 19th century garb to suit the life and the time. So he was a student of Eastern and Western philosophy, and his genius was to take those ancient words and to put them into a modern terminology. He wrote, in all nations there are minds which incline to dwell on the conception of the fundamental unity. This tendency finds its highest expression in the religious writings of the East, and chiefly in the Indian scriptures in the Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vishnu Purana. Speaking of the Bhagavad Gita, he wrote, it was the first of books. It was as if an empire spoke to us, nothing small or unworthy, but large, serene, consistent, the voice of an old intelligence, which in another age and another climate had pondered and thus disposed of the same questions that exercise us. Now, we know that there were uh, a few of his essays that have become the most popular. And we're going to highlight just each one of them to show how in each of these essays, uh, uh, essays he emphasized one of the three fundamentals. In one of his most famous essays, The Oversoul, he wrote, the mind is urged to ask for one cause of many effects, then for the cause of that, and again the cause, diving still into the profound, self-assured that it shall arrive at an absolute and sufficient one, the one that shall be all. Of that ineffable essence, which we call spirit, he who thinks most will say least. When we try to describe it, both language and thought desert us. The essence refuses to be recorded. Language cannot point it with us, point it with, language cannot paint it with colors. 
It is too subtle. It is indefinable, unmeasurable, but we know it pervades and contains us. In one of his other famous works called Compensation, he outlines what we would call our second fundamental, that of law. He calls it the law of compensation, balance, polarity. Polarity or action and reaction, we meet in every department of nature, in darkness and light, in heat and cold, in the ebb and flow of, of waters, in male and female, in the inspiration and expiration of plants and animals, in the systole and diastole of the heart, in the centripetal and trifical gravity, in the undulations of fluids and sounds, in electricity, in galvanism, and chemical affinity. It is, and here, listen to how he expresses the idea of reincarnation. It is the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterwards return again. In his in his uh, essay on nature, he basically outlines some of the central points of the third fundamental on evolution. Quote, there is a latent omniscience, not only in man, but in every creature that impels it to ascend to higher forms of life. Plants are the young of the world, vessels of health and vigor, but they grow upward towards consciousness. The trees are imperfect men and seem to bemoan their imprisonment, rooted in the ground. The animal is the novice and probationer of a more advanced order. All that is inanimate will someday speak and reason. We'll finish up with his uh, special method of spiritual regeneration or making these ideas. And here the emphasis is on self-reliance. And we're gonna read first a poem on self-reliance he wrote in 1832. The little needle always knows the north. The little bird remembereth his note. And this wise seer within me never errs. I never taught it what it teaches me. I only follow when I act aright. And regarding prayer, now you know what theosophy teaches about true prayer and will prayer and action. Listen to what he says. Men's prayers are diseases of the will. Prayer that craves a particular commodity is vicious. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. It is the solid soliloquy of beholding, it is the soliloquy of a beholding and jubilant soul. But prayer as a means to effect a private end is theft and meanness. It supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness. As soon as the man is one with God, he will not beg. He will then see all prayer in his actions. And finally, in the Transcendentalist, you think me as a child of my circumstances. Let any thought or motive of mind be different from what they are, the difference will transform my condition. You call it the power of circumstance, but it is the power of me. And listen to what he says regarding the religion of the coming ages and the emphasis on the individual. The religion of the coming of the ages, it shall not it shall send man home to his central solitude and make him know that much of the time he must have himself for his friend. He shall expect no cooperation. He shall walk with no companion. 
the nameless thought, the nameless power, the super personal heart. He shall repose alone on that. He needs only his own verdict. And so we've seen in all of these individuals, the kernel, the germ of what we would call our modern age and our modern thought. And it's so contemporary that we've so you have these phrases, we haven't even known, we use some of these ideas in the very expression of theosophy from our platforms, even in this century. So we know we've presented a lot, but um, we did want to give a fair but not complete overview. And so we welcome your comments on questions. But we also would like to ask you to think about we haven't talked about the contemporary times. And historians uh, regard the contemporary age as beginning from 1920 to the present and for a generation from now. So what do you think is the mark, have, as we all have lived through it, everyone here lives in the contemporary age. What do you think is the mark the distinguishing thought of the contemporary age that distinguishes it from the modern age, and how better, how should promulgators of theosophy, what should their language be to fit the thought of our contemporary times? We don't necessarily have to expound on it, but something for you to think about on your own. 